21st century and we're living in a world of globalization. A world where companies are forming conglomerates and where nations are forging bonds and cooperations across the borders. And in this world I can order my stuff from almost anywhere in the world and have it shipped to almost anywhere. I can send money around the globe in minutes and do all my investments online. At the end of the year 2022, the world economy had already a volume of a whopping 100 trillion United States dollars. It's a tremendous amount and it's getting more. This amount gets doubled every 15 years. We see this in an ever-growing inflation. Printed into cash, that would be enough to cover the Mediterranean Sea behind me using this. And within this big economy, an amount equal to 4 to 5 trillion gets laundered every year. In comparison, that's the GDP of Japan and Germany in 2022. Money laundering is understood to be a huge problem. And it is a know-it problem. Of course, the methods of money launderers have changed throughout history. Although centuries ago, the pirates usually scavenged and resold merchandise, some pirates would hide treasures on deserted islands mostly in order to cover up the uh, traces of their pirate raids and to be cleared of charges when put to court. A similar thing would happen in the Old West. Desperados would hide the loots from their robberies in abandoned silver mines to recover them after being cleared from charges due to the lack of evidence. The term of money laundering as we use it today actually stems from the United States of America and the city of Chicago. This is the era of the 1920s and 30s, Al Capone's era. Back in the day, the states had a prohibition law banning alcoholic beverages. Of course, Al Capone was notorious for organizing bootleg moonshine alcoholic beverages for the people. Al Capone and his gang rose to power fast, and soon they had a portfolio of other illegal activities from which they earned their dirty money. The official hangout business of Al Capone was actually to run a chain of laundromat stores. He would send his henchmen all over Chicago to exchange dollar bills for coins. The coins would eventually be inserted into the laundromats. So and with the daily revenues, it would end in the company's bank account. So officially, Al Capone was running Chicago's most prosperous Laundry mod chain. Capone felt untouchable and he made the big mistake not to pay the income tax on his company and that earned him 11 years for tax fraud. Well, the way Capone did it still works as a pattern for today's money launderers. Money laundering is done in three stages, which we call placement, layering and integration or introduction. With each stage passed, it becomes more and more difficult to trace back the illegal origin. The first stage, placement, describes how money from an illegal source appears for the first time in the financial system. Money launderers may use money muling or smurfing at this stage and break down big amounts into smaller amounts to enable, for example, their placement in a bank account. The second stage, the layering, is where the actual money laundering process happens and the money appears clean afterwards. This is done by performing a series of bogus transactions between companies and their bank accounts. And with each layer, a new set of supporting documents gets created and hence, the alleged origin of the funds appear to be clean. By the third stage, the money appears cleaned and it's reintegrated back into the economy by spending it, for instance, on luxury items. When we speak of dirty money, we speak of money that comes from predicative offenses. <clears throat> you're, f you're following me? Good. Because I want to say that predicative offenses means money has been generated that should not be there and it entails a money laundering offense. Now what are these offenses? The list that you see here is from the fourth, fifth and sixth anti-money laundering directives which are the basis for every national law in the EU against money laundering. Terrorism is included, but note that terrorism gets funded by both legal and illegal money. The idea is that once a terrorist group uses the funds from a legal source, 
the funds become illegal money. The list is quite broad and covers, as you can see, a wide range of felonies. And of course, there's cyber crimes. Last but not least, there's also inside trading and market manipulation. The most prominent example is the Bernie Madoff scandal. Latest additions include gains from environmental crimes, greenwashing, insurance fraud, as well as tax fraud. Not to forget about the embezzlement in economy and politics, which counts as a predicative offense because it entails deliberately a money laundering offense. In short, we're speaking about everything that will get you locked up for at least one year. Well, tough thing, isn't it? Of course, the financial world has reacted to this by installing two statutory monitoring functions for the operations of credit and financial institutions called the Compliance Officer and the Anti-Money Laundering Officer. Compliance Officers and Anti-Money Laundering Officers in Cyprus are specialists that pass an exam at the local financial market authority SISEC and are included in the public registers of certified persons. In this video, I'll explain both of these functions separately. You'll understand the difference between them and what they have in common. Inside the company's hierarchy, these functions belong to the top management level and remain unbiased to ensure their independence, similar to that of an internal auditor, which is the actual monitoring function of these two functions. It is possible to enroll the same person for both functions. These functions monitor the company and flag out deficiencies or breaches of the applicable law, suggest remedial actions to the senior management and, where necessary, file the reports to the authorities. I myself have been working in these functions for many years. I've been a consultant to many financial institutions and I've provided training to many professionals. The first thing that a compliance officer or an anti-money laundering officer needs to have is an in-depth knowledge of all the applicable legislation. Because without this... <gasps> this is why it is so important, as a first step, to become the Rambo in the jungle of paragraphs. This gives you a solid base for your role as a compliance officer, anti-money laundering officer, as well as as a risk manager and data protection officer. The laws and directives in Cyprus are based on the legislation of the European Union. So let's have a look at them. Here are the basic laws for investment firms. Okay. In comparison, these laws and directives apply for investment funds. Right. Undertakings for collective investments in transferable securities are also investment funds. Just they invest in liquid financial instruments only and have a specific risk spread. <laughs> Both alternative investment funds and usage funds require an external manager for their operations. Unless, of course, they are internally managed. Corporate service providers and fiduciary companies act as professional enablers and gateways for company structures and must hence be regulated. This here is the minimum set of laws and directives to combat money laundering, proliferation and terrorist financing. This is made on EU level and on national level. It follows the OECD standards and it follows the UN standards for AML and CFT. In addition, a variety of laws and directives become applicable for the events that a company encounters in its day-to-day -day operations. It's important to know them in and out.
The use of cryptocurrencies for transactions required a new form of legislation to prevent its abuse for the purpose of money laundering and financing of terrorism. These laws concern the travel rule, meaning how fiat money, which we are using, is converted into crypto units, how these units become transferred from one to another crypto wallet, and how they become converted back into fiat money. Cryptocurrency units can also be steady coins when they have an underlying asset. Cryptos and virtual money are handled by electronic money institutions, for which also a separate legislation was established. Meanwhile, banking as a service and embedded finance, where banks outsource its financial transaction banking, is a growing field. Credit institutions are banks. They are mostly regulated by the national central banks. Regulatory authorities all over the world have established RSS feeds and give instructions on how to install them. These are automated news bulletins and news services on all official announcements. A good compliance officer will install the RSS feeds offered by the competent authorities of the jurisdictions where the company operates, where the clients and counterparties are located and to where services are exported. This depends on the business model. A very good source of information on ethics and standards, as well as a standardized questionnaire for counterparties, is offered by the Wolfsburg Group. They promote a sophisticated compliance culture. This is a consortium of credit and financial institutions headquartered in New York City, United States. While the summary you see here shows the basic tasks, it is safe to say the compliance function measures the degree to which an organization complies with the applicable law and adheres to the standards thereof. First step for the compliance function is to create a monitoring program for the organization as a whole and for each department in the hierarchy by breaking down the laws and paragraphs to filter what legal framework applies to which department and to the organization. A monitoring program also contains the time schedule for inspections per department, the applied methodology and whether complaints were filed during the reporting period. The program states the expected standards and requirements, the practical fulfillment thereof, notes down deficiencies flagged out and contains the suggested remedial action as well as the documented audit trail of the implementation or progress on these remedial actions. At least on quarterly base, a report should be made to the board of directors on the state of the organization. With the legal framework and required standards identified, the compliance function also creates and reviews the manuals for each department to give guidance to staff for the correct performance. The internal manuals become synchronized with the mission and vision of the organization. They range from the general operational manual to cover all functions and activities as well as procedures, to the procedures for the risk management function, which define how the likely impact is identified quantified and mitigated by mathematical formulas to hold a capital buffer and to make market discipline disclosures. Risk managers perform annual organization-wide risk assessments as per ISO 31000 to be reviewed by the compliance department. Then there is the emergency plan to ensure business continues in case of disasters. Manuals and procedures also include the asset management function with their departments as per the organization's authorization. This can be the management of portfolios under a discretionary mandate or brokerage, meaning the reception and transmission as well as the execution of client orders. Both departments are bound to perform the best result for a client or investor, plus there should be guidelines on the prevention of conflicts of interests between and among staff and clients and for the permitted leverage. Furthermore, Guidelines of how to prevent market manipulation inside trading are needed, along with a list of persons that have or may have insider knowledge that will have an impact on the market rates of a financial instrument. Such persons have to be restricted from certain trading operations accordingly. The set of manuals should also include the admin department with their record-keeping practices, 
and safekeeping, meaning where and how the organization stores assets of their clients. Not to forget about guidelines on recruitment and remuneration, work ethics, the protection of whistleblowers, and for the statutory disclosures or the product governance. The code of conduct shall reflect international standards for human rights. With the Directive 1937 of 2019, the EU defined the legal framework to protect staff members from retaliation when they come forward to report illegal activities of the company they work at to the competent authorities. A big slice of manuals and tools to be prepared by the compliance function is in the field of data protection, ensuring that personal data is collected and used upon the informed consent of the individual to whom the data relates, and how the organization ensures data security, and how it handles complaints on GDPR-related matters and complaints in general. Last but not least, the compliance function reviews the privacy policy. The compliance department has to ensure that all individuals in interaction with or in relation to the company remain the full rights to their personal data and that disclosures happen upon informed consent unless the disclosure is made to a governmental body. Such disclosures do not need the consent of the individual. Data security, systems hardening, password and encryption management are essential elements and of utmost importance. The GDPR alone set an amount of 4% of an organization's annual revenues as a fine for cases of data leaks or data disclosures without the data subject's consent. The compliance function also creates the manuals and tools for the anti-money laundering department. It makes sense to combine the compliance and the anti-money laundering function to ensure the tools promote a prudent and thorough monitoring of the company. Regulators give out checklists for the desired minimum standards. The compliance function can compare the internal manuals against these. If the compliance department did a good job in creating the internal governance, manuals, monitoring tools and internal protocol mechanisms, then the company exceeds the expected professional standard and is protected against clients or investors who intend to abuse the services offered for money laundering or the financing of terrorism. Monitoring means to receive and assess reports from each department and to review the workflow per department and employee. The proportionality, meaning the size, nature and complexity of the organization, dictate the efforts needed. This means the compliance department performs an internal gap analysis, meaning to identify blind spots in the company or practices that would expose the company to risks like operational failure or being legally liable for something that could have been avoided to occur or to any other damage or to identify insufficient controls against money laundering or the financing of terrorism. This can include desk-based reviews or to conduct staff interviews on location. The compliance function also listens to all inbound and outbound calls to spot possible illegal content. One more example of good practice in compliance is to ensure so-called Chinese walls are kept and employees have data access on the need-to-know basis to prevent a conflict of interests or data leakage. Each employee will see different areas of the same server environment and has access to a limited area of files. The idea is to balance out the need to ring fence certain data with the need to enable sharing as required per the workflow. The allocation of access rights per department and per employee ties in with this principle in order to achieve optimal and smooth operations. The compliance function ensures statutory staff training was conducted and that all regulatory circulars and what action derived thereof is protocoled. Monitoring also means to watch whether the organization acted within the scope of its authorization, meaning if the services and financial instruments offered were actually permitted. Where within a period of six months no services are offered, the license for these services lapses. 
and where a company doesn't make use of its authorization for a year, it lapses in full. The compliance function will safeguard that all clients were categorized correctly, that the so-called suitability analysis and where brokerage services are offered by the appropriateness test. Client or investor portfolios are checked to ensure they follow the correct parameters for the identified suitable investments as agreed with the client. To make a fair categorization of a client, the personal and economic circumstances as well as the individual risk tolerance and the desired investment horizon of a client are identified. Client categorizations decide the level of investor protection. Retail investors and retail clients should have the highest level. A stop loss maximum drawdown, for example, should prevent uncontrolled losses by setting a mark by when investments become liquefied, just like an emergency exit. Only professional clients or investors, as well as eligible counterparties, are allowed to invest in investment funds unless a special permission for the marketing to retail investors or retail clients is obtained. A client or investor may opt to be categorized as retail, although he or she qualifies to be classified as professional, but not the other way around. Only a reclassification can result in an upgrade classification. Reclassifications must be justifiable. This doesn't of course change the obligation to perform the best execution. The compliance function will check whether the marketing material used is compliant with the requirements as per the applicable laws and makes no false or misleading statements, has the necessary disclaimers to it and gives a fair risk warning. It shall address the correct target audience. The positive and negative target market must be identified. The positive target market means the potential client or investor for whom the investment strategy or financial product is a match. The negative target market means all clients and investors for whom it isn't. Last but not least, all hard copies of internal files shall be kept in a fireproof storage free from unauthorized access. The compliance function also takes care of all the statutory and mandatory reporting obligations towards regulatory authorities. Here you see the reporting calendar of all weekly, monthly, quarterly, semi-annually and annually reports that have to be filed with the regulatory authorities. Regulatory authorities collect the data for their internal statistics to forward them to the European institution that supervises all national regulators. This is the ESMA, the European Securities and Market Authority. The reporting framework supports a prudential supervision of the financial markets to ensure the adherence to the legal framework applicable for all financial and credit institutions and to support a prudential supervision for the prevention of money laundering by making use of services provided by financial institutions and credit institutions. As we understand now, the compliance function ensures the adherence to legal standards and standards expressed by the applicable legislation. Also, the compliance function ensures that the anti-money laundering department operates by adhering to legal standards and by the defined framework and procedures. The reporting calendar and its obligations are subject to change from time to time. This is simply due to the fact that the competent authorities react to the changes of the financial world. This is one of the reasons why the costs for compliance keep rising. These reporting obligations correspond generally to the trends in the financial world as well as to the new types of listed and unlisted financial instruments. They also cover insurance products, pre-EAPs, security financing operations and trade finance operations. Some reports become digitally signed and are submitted via a file client uploader or via the submission portal of the regulatory authority. Other reports become submitted 
via the uploader portal of the central bank. There are also reports that become submitted in Cyprus via the Ariadne portal. Using the tools and manuals developed by the compliance function, the anti-money laundering function is there to protect the organization from situations where the services it offers become abused for laundering money, funding of terrorism or proliferation. So the focus is on the monitoring of business relationships with clients, investors and counterparties. This is done by performance of the appropriate due diligence, by creating economic profiles and by identifying suspicious transactions, always adjusted to the risk that the client, investor or counterparty poses. It's like in the case of the compliance function, the applicable legislation against money laundering and terrorist funding is broken down into a monitoring program to protocol flagged out deficiencies and their remedies. The anti-money laundering function assesses the knowledge of staff and the quality of training to identify the needs for further education on the matter. Also, the AMSCO performs a due diligence on the counterparties of the organization and the AMSCO is responsible to report on a monthly basis all cash transactions, especially those that exceed the amount of 10,000 euros. Where an occasional transaction of a client, an investor in a fund under management or with a counterparty appears unusual when compared to the economic profile of that party, a suspicious transaction report must be filed with the local financial intelligence unit, FIU, at the competent authorities unless the case can be resolved by an internal investigation. Once a report is filed, the FIU will give further instructions. As not to tip off, it is absolutely forbidden to disclose any information on ongoing investigations. In order to identify the risk rating of a client, counterparty or investor, the party and the business relationship must be analyzed using a risk-based approach. The first aspect of this is the client itself. Who is the client? In what profession does the client conduct his or her business? Is the nature of the client's business full of cash transactions? What background, reputation has the client? How does the client behave? Is the client cooperative and transparent? The next aspect deals with the question where the client, investor or counterparty is located or a national of, where they conduct their business and where transactions come from or go to. Is the jurisdiction, for instance, prone to political instability, war or civil unrest? Is it restricted by the FATF or under political sanctions? The third aspect is the question about the product that the client or investor requests. To which extent does it favor anonymity or fast in and out? What's the cooling period? And is this product suitable? And does the transaction make economically sense? This requires in-depth knowledge on all types of listed and unlisted financial instruments. Last but not least, the question is whether the communication with the client, investor or counterparty is face-to-face -face or via verified communication channels and means. Now individuals may have multiple citizenships. When looking into the personal history of an individual, there may be a hint to whether or not a person may have obtained an alternate citizenship somewhere. This is part of the research on a client, investor or a counterparty. There are four general ways of how to obtain multiple citizenships. One being by ancestry, where an ancestor entitles for naturalization in that country. Or by filing an application to the competent government authority after having spent the statutory amount of time for becoming a citizen in that country. Some countries also offer to naturalize investors for example, after having placed a larger investment in that country. The fourth way of obtaining an alternate citizenship deals with special circumstances like adoption, marriage or military service or any other honorary merit. It is very important to know and understand the mechanism under which a country grants an additional citizenship. Clients, investors and counterparties may use multiple passports for their international business. 
One has to be creative on finding out whether or not the client, counterparty or investor has obtained an alternate, an alternate citizenship at some point during his or her life. The laws against money laundering and the financing of terrorism also define politics as a profession prone to embezzlement and corruption and introduce the concept of politically exposed persons or PEPs. PEPs are head figures in states and state organizations. While the laws give a very vague description of who counts as a PEP and who doesn't, it is safe to say that the term PEP and PEP related should include the spouse, children, siblings, first degree relatives and all persons that shared an accommodation for at least one year with the PEP or PEP related person, as well as the business partners, like persons that have a company together with a PEP or PEP related person. A PEP ceases to be a PEP one year after resignation from a political position. While for some financial and credit institutions, politically exposed persons and PEP related persons are simply not acceptable as clients, others might accept them. However, this requires the most thorough background research to eliminate the risk of wealth or income being derived from embezzlement or corruption. This concerns only those PEPs and PEP related persons that generate a side income next to their remuneration from a public function. Now clients, investors or counterparties may be high net worth individuals or ultra high net worth individuals with a structure of companies owned by them in their back. This is a high risk factor and the Department for the Prevention of Money Laundering and Financing of Terrorism must examine the complexity of that company structure, the economic rationale of the company being there and the nature of its business and transactions are the hotspot and focus of interest. Some companies have their share capital in the form of bearer shares, meaning they are not registered under the name of a specific order and favor total anonymity, which is simply illegal to accept. Other entities may have no operations apart from receiving dividend income from shareholding. These are so-called shell companies or international business companies, IBCs. The problem with them is the lack of economic substance. The same goes for so-called shell banks, which is a no-go. Shell banks are banks that have a banking license but no physical offices or employees. It is impossible to regulate or supervise them and their operations remain opaque. While it is legal to register a company in a tax-neutral jurisdiction as an IBC, the transactions with an IBC may be subject to a withholding tax to further reduce the tax base erosion and profit shifting into tax-neutral jurisdictions. At this, the laws introduce the concept of economic substance by the ATAT 3 directive, meaning there should be a physical office and at least one full-time employee as a director with a proper remuneration arrangement and this person should be adequately qualified for the job role. For companies that are interrelated, for example by having the same owner, there is a concept of transfer pricing to show the transaction has an economic rationale behind it and the terms of the transactions are at market rates and are not different from a transaction made as if the companies were not connected to each other. The law sets the threshold to 700k per transaction, but it is safe to say any amount should be subject to justifications by a transfer pricing study. Based on the preliminary information identified with regards to a client, investor or counterparty, the Department for the Prevention of Money Laundering, Financing of Terrorism and Proliferation will determine to which extent the business relationship means a risk for having services offered by the organization abused for laundering illicit money or the funding of terrorists and will create an economic profile as well as a plan for the due diligence and or enhanced due diligence measures required prior to enter into the business relationship for its ongoing monitoring and for the examinations of occasional transactions. Economic profiles for medium risk business partners should be reviewed and updated every 12 months at least, for high risk business partners even in shorter intervals. Tools for risk rating of clients, investors or counterparties should have at least three stages, high risk, medium risk and low risk, 
and should also be reviewed and updated at least every 12 months. The law requires the tools to enable detecting any high-risk client, investor or counterparty as such. The only clients, investors or counterparties ever to be of low risk are actually institutionals. This means eligible counterparties. Due diligence and enhanced due diligence means to perform the research procedures in order to collect supporting KYC documentation on the client, investor or counterparty. <laughs> KYC means know your client. In order to know a client or investor, his or her data and information, as well as the supporting documents thereof, become collected and assessed in the due diligence procedure. KYC is like a menu meal that consists of four components. The first component is to clarify the identity and residential address. For this, a color copy of the passport or ID card is obtained. The copy must be a verified certified true copy. The residential address, not necessarily the nationality of the client or investor, is what decides over the applied verification method. The documents of person resident in Cyprus are verified by local certifying officers, while for every person resident in the EU or in the EEA, a verification by a notary public is sufficient. For persons resident in a third country, the Den Haag apostille is required from a local lawyer who must be a member of that country's bar association. For the attestation or proof of the residential address, excerpts from the citizens' registers and or utility bills showing the name and address of the client or investor are required. The verification method for these documents is as per passports or ID cards. The passport or ID card must always be valid for at least six months. Also, the obtained proof of residence shall not be older than six months. The due diligence has to be extended to include the lawyer, notary public or certifying officer. It has to be ensured that this third party is empowered to perform a lawful verification of the supporting documents of a client or of an investor. Therefore, the third party's identity, residential address, reputation and professional legitimacy must be proven by a counterparty due diligence. Verified entries in governmental registers or verified memberships in bar associations serve as a proof for the legitimacy. Second component of our menu is the background check. This means to obtain a curriculum vitae of the client or investor signed by hand. The idea is to gather information about the educational and professional history of the client or investor in order to understand how the client or investor achieved his or her wealth. The third component is the checkup of the client's or investor's reputation. For this step, an advanced research on the internet for publicly available information is conducted and a number of reliable governmental and official sources of information are consulted. This includes as a minimum the EU and UN sanctions list, the European Banking Association, the IOPA, Imolin, Moneyville and FATF portals, the ESMA library, the World Bank and the IMF, Europol and Interpol's most wanted lists, the Office of Foreign Asset Control of the US Treasury Department, offshore leaks databases and regulatory publications. The sanctions lists of the European Union of the United Nations as well as the lists of the Office for Foreign Asset Control in the USA are very similar. The lists contain the names and persons and enterprises that are restricted from entering into a business relationship with. In the EU, the official journal of the European Union notifies of all new additions, updates of and additions to these lists. All sanctions lists along with all guidelines, directives, announcements and consultation papers can be found in the ESMA library. Currently, there is a variety of automated screening softwares out there which support these research efforts. Among them are programs like the portal of WorldCheck, Sentinel, Reliant and World Compliance. They also show pending investigations as well as past convictions in any country. The fourth component of our menu is the question on sources of wealth and respectively the origin of funds of a client or investor. At this, supporting documents for the proof of income or assets are obtained. The aim is to verify why and from where the income or fortune of a client or investor stems and whether the source has the financial capability to provide such an income or fortune. These supporting documents must be certified by the same method like a passport or ID card. While sources of wealth means from where a fortune or income stems, the term origin of funds means the amount that a client or investor will invest. 
This amount must be identifiable as being a partition of the declared fortune or income. The tables here show examples for acceptable sources of incomes and fortunes. It also illustrates by which parameters supporting documents should be analyzed. Risk rating and risk profile dictate whether to apply due diligence or enhanced due diligence. How deep to dig is decided as the case may be. Some clients or investors may be individuals, others may be legal persons such as enterprises, partnerships, companies and or trusts. Companies are legal persons that have to be registered in an official governmental register in the jurisdiction of their domiciliation. Therefore, it should always be possible to obtain an excerpt thereof. Such information contains the name of the company, its registration number, its official address as well as the data on its secretary or representative, the managing directors as well as on the shareholders and partners or members. Furthermore, the date of incorporation must be shown. This can be one or several documents depending on the jurisdiction. Where the excerpt shows that the company is active, it can be equal to a certificate of good standing. A certificate of incumbency shows whether the company has liabilities towards any debtors or third parties. Meanwhile, most countries also introduce registers showing the ultimate beneficial owner of a company. The memorandum and articles of association of a company define the purpose of the company operations and what activities it is permitted to have, who had been registered as a shareholder and who had been registered as a managing director. Many countries provide a history in case of changes. The ultimate beneficial owner and the shareholder may be different persons. Some companies have other companies as shareholders, which requires to research the chain down to the real ultimate beneficial owner. Also, these supporting documents are required to be certified through copies by the same method as for the passports or ID cards. In the course of this research, all qualified shareholdings held by individuals or legal persons holding 25% or more of the share capital must be identified. While persons holding qualified holdings may not be the ultimate beneficial owners, however, the holding percentage may entitle the holder or holders to exercise control via the annual general meeting. For every individual or legal person identified in the chain, a checkup of the reputation is performed by consulting the reliable sources of information. All identified directors and shareholders are subject to a separate KYC due diligence. It must be verified whether or not an individual or legal person is subject to political sanctions, a high-risk person by default or subject to a political embargo due to the jurisdiction of residence or registration. For eligible counterparties such as banks, insurance undertakings, investment firms, investment funds or fund managers, a copy of the authorization by the competent regulatory authority and an excerpt from the regulator's register must be collected. The supporting documents for the sources of wealth and respectively the origin of funds being a partition of the wealth shall be in the form of the latest audited annual financial statements. They should be made and signed by an ACCA certified chartered accountant. For legal persons domiciled in jurisdictions without the obligation by law to have audited annual financial statements, a non-statutory audit shall be demanded. Where the income and fortune stems from agreements, contracts and invoices accordingly, the same requirements apply to individuals as for legal persons with regards to their verification. Eligible counterparties also include trust funds. Similar to common funds, they can be on a contractual basis. Therefore, they can be deemed to be a legal person in some jurisdictions, while in others, they may not qualify to be seen as such. Trusts may serve a public or charity course or the interests of private individuals. In every case, one must identify and verify the trustee or commissioner, the beneficiary, the settler, the protector, as well as all the persons exercising management in the trust fund. To check up the reputation of a trust fund, the reliable sources of information become consulted. All individuals or legal persons identified in the trust fund are subject to a separate KYC due diligence and the assets, fortune, wealth and or income of the trust by audited annual financial statements. It all sure is a lot of work. And this is how it's done to know your client or investor. <laughs>
So while the anti-money laundering function monitors transactions using the tools made by the compliance function and shall detect and report suspicious transactions, there is also a general mechanism for the reporting of transactions. All these reports are coded XML files. One is the CRS report, which was introduced by the OECD to ensure transparency and to make transactions traceable. Next to it, there is the DAC6 reporting mechanism. This concerns all cross-border transactions, where one party involved is EU-based. Furthermore, there is the reports for the Foreign Asset and Tax Control Act between the USA and all other countries to report all transactions involving US citizens, US residents, and US-based enterprises. FATCA reports, are made to <laughs> FATCA reports are made to national authorities and shared with the IRS in the USA. Many professionals don't know how to code these reports, so let's take a look at how it's done. The whole report is one XML tag with UTF-8 encoding and a head description for the type of report. Average knowledge of HTML and XML coding for websites is, a, is enough to understand this. Inside the main XML tag, a series of headers and information blocks is created that will specify the sender, receiver, and amount of, and date of the report of the transaction. The subtags are to be populated with the data set which derives from the transaction monitoring and from the internal accounting records. Let's take a walkthrough to learn what is reported and how it is reported. The subtext for message expect contains the tax ident number of the organization that is filing the report and the date and time index of the report as well as the type of report. For instance, CRS 701 stands for a report to provide the authorities with new information. One can see how data interlinks the subtext within the XML coded report. For CRS reports, the 31st of September of the past year is the reference date for the reporting period, while the timestamp is the day and time of the day where this report is made. <laughs> Let's move on to the body section. Inside this section is where information blocks on report of the transactions are created. Mm. The subtag for the reporting financial institution contains data on the organization that sends the report. This includes the tax identification number, the name of the organization, the country of residence as an acronym, and the detailed registered address of the head office. Here at the doc spec tag it says OECD1 as new data will be submitted. Together with the tax identification number and the reference date, an identifier for the report is generated. The account report section is populated with the details of the receivers of a transaction. In the case of, in the case of a financial institution, the receivers are clients mm, 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 for investors receiving profits or redemption amounts. Again, a doc spec tag is placed to specify the OECD type and identifier used. Then, the bank account number of the receiver is specified under OECD 601 by IBAN and the information block provides the details like the receiver's country of residence, the receiver's local tax ID number or, if this is not known, the receiver's passport number. Also, the full name is given in the name tag as well as the receiver's full address as per the verified supporting KYC documents. Last but not least, the receiver's date of birth the place of birth shall be inserted into the subtext as seen in my example here. This shows once more why KYC data is so crucial to collect and to verify. The account balance tax refers to the amount that was transacted and the payment type, like CRS 501, indicated how the transacted amount was declared. Here, for example, as dividends from an investment. The transaction amount is only the transaction amount is the only account balance known by the institution unless a client or investor provided a bank statement. Of course, the example that I coded in here is a bit generic and simple and cannot cover any specific cases at all. The XML coded FATCA report looks pretty much similar to the CRS report. It has the same head tag and is encoded also in UTF-8. 
Just a command headline contains information for a FATCA compliant OECD report. This is due to the requirements by the IRS in the USA. Again, uh, the tag for the financial transaction code contains an identifier of the reporting entity, here the tax identification number, plus the country of residence mm, of the reporting entity. Receiver is US, of course. And the message type is FATCA, of course. The report's identifier is the reportable person's name and the year concern. Date and time is added again in the text within the message head. <laughs> the FATCA block is like the body section of the CRS. Also in this report there is a tag section with information on the reporting financial institution with the country code as an acronym and the tax identification number plus the full name of the financial institution that files the report. This tax section has the address of the reporting financial institution as a fixed tag with a breakdown plus a free tag as a query string. Both are mandatory to be included by the way. These reports end up at the US IRS. Similar to the CRS reports, also the FATCA reports have a docs back tag section. The code for a new report is FATCA1. For follow-up reports it is FATCA2. The details for acceptable coding options are published in the handbook by the IRS and easy to be understood. That is why a compliance and anti-money laundering function should be staffed with tax savvy personnel. The information block on the reportable US citizen, US resident or US based enterprise is the reporting group tag. This tag contains again the doc spec setting correspond to the reporting financial institution. Also, the active target bank account named by IBAN to where an amount was transacted. Of course, such a report can also refer to accounts that don't exist anymore. What follows is the tag section to provide details on the reportable individual or company. First, of course, the country code as an acronym and the reportable person's tax identification number. <laughs> Plus the full name and address details just as per the verified supporting KYC documents. Same goes for the full address with a fixed tag to provide a breakdown of the reportable person's address, city, postcode and state. Then a free tag to give a query string of the same data. The account holder tag also contains date of birth. All information is per the collected KYC documents. The supporting KYC documents are the main source when populating the report. That is why this is a must-have. The last part concerns the substantial owner, meaning the report of the person and the personal data related to it, which under the data protection laws of the USA and the EU may be disclosed just like that to the authorities. It doesn't require any <laughs> consent. With the substantial owner tag being populated, the amount mm, that is subject to the report of the transaction and the denominated currency used are added. My example used FATCA 504 for aggregated gross proceeds from an investment portfolio. It's also applicable for redemptions of units held in AIEFs or use its investment funds. This simple example shows the efforts made by financial institutions. Some perform this in-house, others source it out. While well, financial and credit institutions in Cyprus are usually foreign financial institutions under reporting model 1. In case the GIAN is not available or unknown, it is okay to use the reportable person's US social insurance number or the reportable person's company registration number in instead of the GIAN. For a compliance function as well as for an anti-money laundering function that manages CRS and FATCA, it is also feasible to perform the DAC6 reports. These reports became mandatory for cross-border payment arrangements, which one transaction partner is EU-based. The report has the head pack to specify the type of report and the block concerning the reportable payments under the disclosure pack, similar to CRS and FATCA. The reporting organization is displayed by a breakdown of personal details, and just this report then has a tag with the EU-based nexus and its capacity. The relevant taxpayer tag 
provides the details of a tax liable EU nexus under the organization tag and in the secondary section on the transaction partner outside of the EU. In my example, I chose an IBC in the British Virgin Islands. The example I coded has a fictitious law firm controlling the EU nexus as an intermediary. This is why it is shown in the intermediary tag with its data. The disclosure information tag describes the actual reportable amount and transaction. The coding remains almost the same also under DAC7. The method of coded XML reports under the MIFIR and EMIR regime follow the very same model. The difference between the two is that MIFIR reports focus on the best execution factors, while reports under the EMIR regime focus on data regarding the counterparties involved in the transaction. In Cyprus, these reports are submitted via the Ariadne portal. Both functions, the compliance function and the anti-money laundering function, will write a detailed report within the first quarter of the following year, which follows the structure shown in here. This is why a monitoring program most detailed is a must, as the report will be based upon the content of these internal records of the organization. The reports of the compliance function and of the anti-money laundering function should document the organization's progress in remedying deficiencies over the years. These two reports are also part of the supervisory exercise of the internal audit function. The reports are presented to the board of directors where it is discussed and confirmed for the submission to the competent authorities by the signatures of all directors. In Cyprus, the Cyprus Securities and Exchange Commission, CISEC, provides a file uploader with a digital signatures function to serve as an additional confirmation of the report's validity. The reporting obligations vary depending on the type of organization. The regulatory authorities, like CISEC, have the power to summon and question any person of the organization and to conduct inspections or to request any of the internal records of the organization, which is under their supervision. The EU will soon launch a new authority to supersede national FIUs. This will happen in the mid-2020s and serves in an effort to strengthen supervision of the financial markets. With all these mechanisms and measures for supervision in place, one might ask why there is money laundering, financing of terrorism and proliferation at all. Well, the answer is the human factor. The best practice requires the adequate personal, moral and ethical standards of individuals at the levels of the senior management and the three lines of defense, which is the internal audit, risk and control functions and business operations. Every professional must fulfill his or her tasks and duties duly and orderly in order to support the integrity of the global financial markets. So, thank you for watching this film.